Hi, welcome. I'm so excited you guys are all here. Are you enjoying the conference? Yeah? And how many of you had a good time last night? Okay, and, and, and how many of you are enjoying the conference? <laughs> yeah, okay. Welcome, this is Five Minutes of Fame. It's uh, one of the NMC's signature events. It's one of our very fun, fun events. For those of you who haven't been here before, I'll explain what it's like in just a minute. But first, I would like to once more extend a thank you to our conference hosts, Susan Mitros and Holly Willis. And, and everyone at USC who has just been so wonderfully helpful and friendly and awesome. So thank them too. So today for five minutes of fame, we have nine presentations. And the way that this works, it's a very fast format. Each presentation, each speaker or group of speakers has five minutes to speak and say whatever they would like about their projects. At the end of five minutes, they will get gonged. We have a very talented gonger here I'd like to introduce. Lorenzo Bernardi. And he's going to give us a taste of what the gong sounds like. Thank you very much. I wish that that, that could happen as I walk down the street. You know, I could just kind of wave my hand and a gong would go off. That'd be awesome. But oh well. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Alan Levine, who's the MC for the Five Minutes of Fame. And hold on to your hats. Here we go. Much. I'm just curious, how many people have done Five Minutes of Fame before? OK, we want to see the rest of you up here next, on next year on the stage. But first up, I'm really happy to <clears> announce <throat> our first presenter is going to be Virginia Kuhn from USC. She's done this now. I think this is our third year in a row. And mm -hmm. I think she's starting to get to be a regular. She's trying to catch up to Jared Bendis. But <laughs> we'll get to Jared later. Virginia's going to be telling us about articulation assessment and how USC has been exploring using digital storytelling for assessment. So Virginia, you're up. All right. Um, so I'm Virginia Kuhn. I'm the Associate Director of the Institute for Multimedia Literacy. And um, I am here to talk to you about assessment, which is really not a very fun topic. So I thought I would start with an anecdote. Um, I have spent the last seven days on a jury trial on a criminal court case. And this trial centered completely on a piece of video evidence. We watched this video time and time again. It was a surveillance video. This is actually the USC campus. This was a surveillance video in a hospital. And I sat there for seven days feeling all smug because I know how to read video. This is what I do. This is what I teach. And amazingly, and this is a view of the world unmediated. So um, amazingly, at the end, as the attorneys are summing up their arguments, they applied voiceover to the video and made it say something completely different in each case. Um, so what this brought to light for me it was a powerful reminder that human experience, and we've said this here today, is mediated and contingent. Contingent. Um, it's also a really good reminder that video is increasingly ubiquitous. Um, I would venture to say that it is uh, what, as ubiquitous as writing um, has been until now. And then images plus words are very, very powerful things. That said, um, I'm here to talk about um, a web text that I recently published with my colleagues, DJ Johnson, who's back here, and Dave Lopez in Kairos, uh, which is an, a digital peer-reviewed journal of technology, rhetoric, and pedagogy. And uh, in the last spring um, issue, we published this piece called Speaking with Students. Uh, profiles in Digital Pedagogy. I thought I would show that to you right away and give you the URL so when I get gonged, I'll at least have given you that. It is on the um, NMC site, and I really invite you to take a look, uh, walk around into it. Well, why did we, um, why did we do this web text? Uh, what's the point? Um, the web text is very complex, and in this introduction, we sort of um, talk about the reason we did this. I've been working for years and years trying to establish a digital portfolio, a persistent repository that can house natively digital work. I've been working with the supercomputing centers across the country, and the fact is it's very, very difficult. Um, the reasons for the difficulty is that there is 
media variety. Um, it's really hard. If we have a project, I'll show you a couple of clips from some student projects. Application obsolescence. It won't, you know, who's going to keep up all these projects that we do in media five years from now? And then, of course, for assessment, which I think, um, you know, assessment has been raised up and down, um, on and off throughout the conference. I think it's not something that's very popular to talk about. And yet, we're in a university situation, or I am. Um, I'm in a classroom with students. I give them a grade, and I think we ignore assessment to our peril for, for that reason alone. I think that there's a pedagogical imperative to let students know why uh, they are graded the way they are. I also think to justify ourselves to the bean counters or uh, you know, to the powers that be, we really need to show the sort of effort that goes into these projects. So um, after you go off the introduction page on this web text, you'll see a page like this that features a different student. You'll see um, this amazing video that I'll show you clips from that DJ uh, Johnson cut and edited with the students' pieces. They're five minutes long. And then there's text because, again, the other thing we never want to forget is that text is very much we love words. Words still do amazing things digitally. We don't just get rid of words, we use them. So let me give you just a tiny bit of flavor for the um, student work that we have. Um, the project is entitled The Role of Toxin and Toxin Pairs in Cell Death, Cell Survival, and E. coli. My project focuses on research that I've done in the laboratory in the... There's one. Uh, she's a biology major. Here's another student who is um, this what I really appreciate with the IML major program is that it offers the opportunity to work with cool equipment, cool technology, and, and I'll apply let you that look through the rest of that later. Here is the rubric. <laughs> Here's the, I am not getting going. Here is the rubric that you will find on the web text, and actually you will find it animated. So there'll be little tiny clips there of um, students actually talking about each of the uh, conceptual each of the uh, parameters, which are conceptual core, form and content, research component, creative realization. Thank you. <laughs> no God. It's not fun unless you get gong, but that's just my opinion. Thank you, Virginia. Next up, we're going to have Lou Rera from Buffalo State College. We got to move, meet Lou this year. He did a presentation for our virtual symposium, his first time in a virtual world. He did a fantastic talk, and now he's going to do his first five minutes of fame. Since we're in Disneyland, I think we're going to get a um, maybe the answer to a fairy tale of how IT rescued a $100,000 no-budget project. So Lou, tell us your story. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the five minutes of fame. I'm Lou Rera, and I'm from Buffalo State College. How IT did indeed save a $100,000 no-budget project, which was amazing. First, I want to define the problem. How do you create a one-gig network from an old infrastructure at, at when a, a New York State slashed our budgets? Um, maybe put it this way. How does the communication department provide video server access to students at a fraction of the projected cost? Or how do you keep uh, prevent students from mutiny if, if they cannot edit at a network system? Well, I thought maybe I should let the students tell you themselves. So let's uh, see what they had to say about it. going to be stuck here. We'll never get a chance to edit if we don't! I don't care! Enter the code and wait. That's all we ever do. Nobody ever gets off the damn computers when they're supposed to anyways. All right already! Would you guys enter the code? These computers will never be networked. We're just puppets. I'm not doing this anymore. I don't care if the whole place explodes. But Jack told us to do this! You don't know dick about Jack. 
Okay, Amanda, now! Sorry, Al. We're working for Ben now. He's got plans. No more waiting for the same workstation. Video server, any time, any computer. You're all fools! If you think Ben is gonna upgrade these computers to a video server, you've got another thing coming. The students and I had a good time putting it together, and I have to thank the theater students and the comm students for uh, pitching in to help out with this. Um, I did kind of cheese out of the bad robot thing at the end of this, but I will go into how uh, they actually did help us with the IT state. Bad robot! Okay. All right. Uh, the Ben they were referring to is not Ben Linus that we all know and love, who got his head beat in all the time, but actually a guy named Ben Christie from Buffalo State College who was our Dean of Arts and Humanities. And he says yay, yay or nay to all the checks that go through the school. So what we did was we went to an outside vendor, asked for 100,000 bucks in uh, the cost of the actual server system. That's a diagram of what it would have done, eventually tying into the BSC media server for online stuff. But what happened was there was no server, no money, and this is what we had at, at the campus, a Dell Ecologic server. I'm gonna go through all the stats there, but I don't have time, so I'm just gonna let those rip by. And um, show you the actual server itself, which is kind of a cool thing. And when you tear it apart, you've got inside 96 one terabyte drives. We have 10 of those, which is really great for us. The only thing we had to do was install a infrastructure of a one gig line going to the computer labs, which these people did for us and other people. Then we had somebody in from our department, Brian Milbrandt, who is the benchmark tester. And what he eventually did for us was to take, catch my breath, computers, 17 Max and uh, 17 IMAX, Pro Max. Uh, we had a one gigabyte network versus an external Firewire 800 drive. We tested it through a 20 gig video file. The Firewire drive performed at 10, 10 minutes, 14 seconds, the one gig drive, five minutes, 26 seconds, or uh, yes, you get it. And then two 17 Mac labs running Final Cut Pro got the benefits of all this. All we had to do was get the router for the one gig line, and everything I'm telling you in all this makes it better for the students that they don't have to uh, worry about getting on. We're doing a little bit of convergence, but students still have a way to complain. That's the way it goes. And everything I told you about this thing is true. But did you say like the, you open the doors? No, I'm not gonna give away the ending, okay. <laughs> now I'm really happy to introduce uh, some good friends and colleagues from Houston Community Colleges. Laura Goff and Laura LaCroix are gonna be telling us about their ebook projects. And um, I had to read the title twice, but it's Kindling Students, I think it's giving them the Kindles, HCC's ebook classroom project. You've got five minutes starting now. Thank you. I'm Laurel, she's Laura. There's a quiz later. Um, considering how quickly the digital revolution has overtaken other media, Sony's prediction that digital content would outstrip print in five years may be accurate. What this means for education remains to be seen, but there's a certainly a revolution ongoing in how we do things, how teachers teach, and how students learn. So we tried to imagine what it would be like to have no more 40-pound book bags lugged around campus. What it would be like if the cost of textbooks no longer approached or surpassed the cost of tuition, especially at a community college. And if students could have one portable device for the entire sequence of their degree that could run on a week-long battery life before it needed a charge. We had some questions we wanted to ask about this revolution, and they're all posted on the NMC site. There's no time now. Uh, we chose the Kindle DX as an ebook platform and taught a total of six sections this past academic year. Two English compositions, uh, two philosophy, one biology, and one chemistry class. The Kindles were issued to students and materials were converted to Kindle formats and posted on the project website to be downloaded by the students directly into the machines via Amazon's WhisperNet, and copywritten material was available through the Amazon site. According to Doug, Amazon was complete turkey to work with. They didn't set anything up so we could use POs. They insisted on cash or credit cards. We work for Houston Community College. That doesn't go over well. It took actually his emailing Jeff Bezos to get anything done. 
Okay. Um, another problem they had was a predatory pricing structure. This is all Doug's notes. Um, for the online textbooks, that was appalling and, my word, intractable. His wasn't so nice. Uh, the chemistry book we used was the sixth edition, while the seventh is the current. Their price for the electronic version of the sixth was $101. On their website, the paperback of the same edition was less. So the chemistry students rebelled and refused to actually buy the book. So our stats are a little skewed that way. Um, the study's going to continue. This summer, there are three English classes actually using the Kindles. My colleagues were jealous. And there are three classes in the fall. iPad pilots are beginning this summer, an anatomy and physiology class and English composition in the fall. I'm in a good place. Uh, finally, Doug anticipates using the new e-reader specifically targeted toward education, the KNOs, formerly Kakai, in the fall as well. Okay. Hi, I taught the English classes both <laughs> semesters. Uh, I had a mustache before, don't worry. Um, freshman composition, one in, two in the fall and one in the spring using the Kindles. During the fall, the Comp 2 class, which focuses on argumentation and research, use a book the students purchased through the Amazon site, uh, Charles Pierce's Idiot America, as a text through which the students learn to recognize, analyze, and evaluate ar elements of argument. During the spring semester in Comp 1, which focuses on introductory collegiate writing, a variety of free materials from the internet were converted to PRC and PDF files for download by the students. The tech-savvy students had no problem with the Kindle at all. It was a very minimal learning, cur learning curve, and the less tech-savvy ones actually picked it up fairly straightforwardly. Students seemed to collectively enjoy the reading experience itself, but the other aspects of the Kindle, not so well received. Students didn't like the difficulty of navigating uh, to previously read sections of the text using locations. They liked being able to flip pages back and forth. Um, the notations feature was another, something most students had tried to use, but many ended up switching back to paper. One comment I had from a student was, I can write down the location number and my note in the time I could find the location on the machine. Uh, kind of a problem. Okay, one thing all students liked was the price. The book, which was out in hardback, was $28.99 in the bookstore. If you went to Kindle, it was $9.99. They were happy about that. The free materials, of course, were free and already available, but having them easily at hand was a definite plus for the students who had fewer excuses for not being ready for class. Okay. Overall, the students liked using the Kindles, but they had some reservations about the technology of the machines themselves. One student this spring actually used the Kindle app on his laptop so he could switch over to Word, Word and take notes. Most students liked the idea of an e-reader, but they were divided about the actual machine. Many wanted to be able to do other things like surf the internet and chat and instant message. I, as the teacher, like the Kindle. They had to read. It was a good thing. Okay, so the questions I have to answer in the remaining time are, are e-books and e-readers ready for the classroom? In the fall, the posted survey questions centered around usability of the e-book readers. With 69% response rate, a vast majority of students agreed to strongly agree that e-readers as a concept in general are effective tools for reading, learning, studying, collaborating, and assessment. There was a positive experience for the Kindle in ease of use and reading content. 66% of the students are hopeful that campuses will go paperless. 59% Thank you. I was starting get, to get worried that they had practiced so much that no one would get gone, so <laughs> thank you. We thought it <laughs> that was wonderful. And as I said, you're going to be able to get the full presentation from the NMC website. Next up, we have some uh, folks from Full Sail University. We had a chance to visit Full Sail about a year and a half ago. And if you ever get a chance to go to Orlando, uh, you should go there. Actually, I want to enroll. <laughs> Um, it's just an amazing place to learn, and uh, they do some fabulous things, including this great partnership that they're going to talk about. So we have Holly Ludgate and Sharon Craven from Full Sail, along with Sharon Gabriel from Orange County Public Schools. And these are some of the most well-prepared presenters we ever had. So use your five minutes. Keep reading 
Cause this book's gonna be a good book. Cause this book's gonna be a good book. Cause this book's gonna be a good, good book to read. Cause this book's gonna be a good book. Cause this book's gonna be a good book. Cause this book's gonna be a good, good book to read. Pick up that book and turn the page. You'll never know just what you'll find. Information or fantasy, drama and art. I'll make you smart. I'm Sharon, and I'm fortunate to be the principal at Okoye Middle School. And this is Holly and Kathy, and they are my amazing partners at Full Sail University. Um, I became a principal about two years ago, not quite, and was immediately faced with what I, I thought was a huge problem, and that is uh, basically the huge disconnect between today's educational system and our children. And uh, fortunately, shortly after that, I met Holly, um, went to Full Sail University for, for a tour, and as I like to call it, drank the Kool-Aid. Um, had a big aha and immediately decided that Full Sail University was the answer to the student engagement crisis. Since I can't take my kids there, I kind of thought, well, let me just go ahead and uh, convert my campus into a little mini Full Sail. And basically, I set about doing that. And uh, this past year, we launched two edu gaming classes, two digital multimedia classes, and a digital art class. You see some student work flashing before you. And remember, these are middle schoolers, not high schoolers. I couldn't be prouder, prouder of them. Earlier this year, we, we partnered again to create uh, the music video that you saw part of to promote student literacy. And again, a music video, that's another universal language for teenagers, and that was the point of doing that. Um, we were very fortunate. Later on this year, it got, got picked up by YouTube, went viral. And then not too long ago, we were very, very fortunate to be on uh, the Oprah show. The music was featured. Our students couldn't be prouder. The most important part of all of this process um, that came out of the partnership with Full Sail is that student and teacher engagement are way, way up, and that, of course, was the goal. Um, we don't have hard data yet, but I'm certain it's going to go up. But anyway, um, we're about to launch and continue our trend and move into um, challenge-based learning this next year to uh, continue with student engagement. Gonna and be so thank you, that's our story. Book, cause this book's gonna be Awesome video. You guys are great. Next up on stage right, we're going to hear from Helmut Bear from Dartmouth College about some things they're doing with 
training their student techs. And uh, this is going to be another media-rich presentation. And Helmet's going to be telling us about their plasma playground. Take exactly. it away, Helmet. Thanks, Alan. It's great to be here. Uh, my name is Helmut Baer. I'm from Dartmouth College, Jones Media Center, and I'm here to share some of the creative work our student techs have produced for the plasma screen at the Media Center. And since we are at Disneyland, we thought, why not have some fun with JMC at NMC? So let's hear it from our resident rapper, Mr. MC Jones, featuring the Jones Media Center student techs. We help maintain equipment, we deal with all the max. We give it bunch of software, we are the student techs. Final Cut, Photoshop, InDesign, GarageBand, and iMovie, me groovy, iMovie, we groovy. We clean DVDs and we quality check. I am, you are, they are, we are. The Jones Media Center, the Jones Media Center, the Jones Student Techs. Second is the center of the center. Okay, now look at when you enter the plasma. Say what? what? The plasma say what? what? Five and two inches, but everybody cringes. Nothing going on here. Nothing going on here. Nothing going on here. Let's not be dramatic. We might, might as well be static. static. Well, if you had come to the media center 12 months ago, this is pretty much all you got. So last summer, we decided to do something about it. Why not use the Jones software and equipment to promote our large DVD collection? Let's bring in a student text to help produce content for the plasma and promote our DVD collection. I was excited, they were excited, sort of. It did sound like more work, our own plasma playground. We realized for this idea to be successful, plasma project had to be sustainable, fit around the regular tech duties and get everybody involved. The first idea was simple. As new DVDs arrive at the center, scan the covers and produce keynote slideshows that run on the plasma. Positive feedback was instant. Users could glance visual clues of our latest 100 DVDs while checking out videos at the media circulation desk. Our next idea, movie trailers. Select five to 10 videos each month, produce a trailer and add a synopsis. The techs learned more advanced features in Keynote and produced some of their own trailers in Final Cut and iMovie. Our latest project, interactive 3D carousel slideshows designed in Flash. Users are able to browse the latest DVDs and only a click away access the online catalog. As ideas kept evolving, we kept exploring different software applications. In fact, these Plasma projects turned out to be a great source for hands-on training in a peer-based learning environment that offered student techs opportunities to be creative on the job. Of course, not all was creative all the time, like, check it out, scanning 100 DVD covers. So, to keep it interesting, we developed a series of other promos. For example, Let It Snow, showcasing seasonal events. This holiday special got us into Quartz Composer. We invited faculty to share some of their film expertise and produced a feature on director Michael Haneke. And we started promoting special events. In this example, the Sparky Awards contest. Really. We were flying, ideas kept coming left and right. We were in the zone, the tax zone, or so we thought, until, but check out for yourself. Well, there we go. Out went the plasma, out went my NMC title. So, what to do? Maybe text to the rescue one more time. Hey guys, Matt Cooper, listen. Did you come up with a new title for my NMC presentation? Yes, we did. Did you get Mickey's autograph for us? Yes, I did. <laughs> but listen, I'm kind of pressed for time here. Can you just send Ending me a slide? slide. Testing title. LCD elaborations? Man, that's great. That works for me. Listen, guys, I have just one more thing for you to do. These two 
late. <laughs> How many, you really fooled me. You're kind of this mild-mannered guy. He's kind of quiet in rehearsal. And he's up here rapping. <laughs> That was fabulous. <laughs> oh, I gotta compose myself. Okay, so I don't know if anybody here got to experience the Russian Revolution, but Molly Ruggles from MIT is gonna show you how they were able to present some of that on an interesting new timeline tool. So Molly, show us the revolution. Hi, I'm Molly, and I wanna tell you about a course that we uh, worked on at MIT where we tried to transform the assignments that students had to do from something quite traditional to something that utilized digital technologies and allowed students to find interactions between uh, the work that they were doing. Um, so Elizabeth Wood taught the class and she, her traditional way of doing it was to assign every student a particular event from the Russian Revolution, which the year 1917 was really kind of intense and a lot of stuff happened. So she chose that year and she said, okay, Kim, you need to look at the Kerensky uh, event and you need to see it from the point of view of industrial workers. And, we're, and she chose several primary sources for um, Kim to use to analyze. And then she would say, okay, Tyrone, you need to um, look at the Kerensky event from the point of view of soldiers in the field and how that conflict um, affected uh, soldiers and the impact that it had on them. And, she, uh, and, and the student would analyze several primary sources translated into English and so forth. Um, but we thought, well, we have all this siloed information and somehow wouldn't it be nice to make it so that the information was more connected and we could see uh, patterns and relationships. For example, you could trace the development of events from the point of view of soldiers in the field or from workers. Keep in mind that the course is about 25 to 30 students and I'm sort of using a small sample to show you sort of our mindset. But we also, also saw, thought, besides looking at it from this perspective, which is what historians call diachronic, we were gonna look at it from the perspective of arranging the material that the students created in a way that you could investigate, investigate the Kerensky conflict and look at that conflict from various different points of view, as well as the provisional government and so forth. So we came up with a timeline that has as an x-axis time and as the right axis, the um, various stakeholder groups uh, uh, arranged uh, just randomly. So you can explore the timeline by clicking on one of these dots. And for example, for soldiers, this is student work. This is a package of student work, which is the analysis, um, the, the brief analysis as well as a full analysis here and you can explore it through time and you can see how events develop for soldiers. But you can also look at the timeline um, synchronically which is to look at it in regards to a single event like the Kerensky conflict and you can look at student work um, on how, how it impacted activists. You see a brief um, a uh, review of it here, the full analysis is here, as well as links to the primary source material that the students used. You can see it from the point of view of workers and soldiers and so forth. So you can look at the material um, vertically uh, by, um, by different stakeholders experiencing the same event. Um, so what we need to do as far as our next steps, this is our first year of doing it, um, we need to populate the site with more student work over the next two to three years. I think we'll get a richer data set. We also need to, we want to enhance the interface so that students can comment and respond to each other's work. Um, we want to introduce faceted browsing so that, of comments so that threads can be connected, may perhaps to multiple events. We've had some interest from other educators who want to use this in other really key, significant years in history. So we're going to look at some other um, applications of this. And, um, I, I had a little timer, and the timer doesn't work, so I have no idea when the gong's gonna happen. Um, just roll with it. Um, so I think that's all I really wanna say about the Russian history uh, timeline. Thanks a lot. That's good, Molly. I think going with the timer is chicken, don't you? Just get up here and, and do your five minutes, okay. 
I don't know about you, but for me, watching these over the years, we're getting, every year we elevate the level of what happens in these five minutes of fame, and that's going to happen in this next one. You're going to see something really completely different. Seiji Ikeda and Colin Hover are from University of Texas Arlington are going to be talking and showing us some touchless interactive art. And there's a small window for some audience participation, possibly. It might get <laughs> kind of crazy, but uh, you're going to be really amazed what you see, so take it away. Thank you. Uh, we are part of the visual communications area in the art and art history department, where Colin is conducting his graduate studies. Our area of research is in web-based art, and that is art that is specifically made for the web platform. As you can see, Rachel is currently demonstrating how to interact appropriately with Colin's touchless, gesture-driven web piece. Uh, the dots are attracted to motion, but repelled by collisions. These art pieces are constructed at low cost, uh, utilizing flash and consumer level hardware. In this case, a MacBook with its built-in webcam. Um, the reason we went with this form of interaction is because most web art is device reliant. Using a mouse, your finger in a touch-based system, or some visual marker as in augmented reality. And we asked ourselves, would it be possible to remove these said devices entirely thereby creating a more intimate and innate reaction. In this second piece, uh, the objects are leaving a trail that can be erased with gestures. In essence, uh, Rachel is actually doing reverse painting with this uh, racing maneuver. And this is an interesting finding where the art piece turns the user into the performer. Um, something that doesn't happen with traditional art. Most people don't go in front of a Monet and start dancing in front of it. Um, in addition, this system has the advantage of a shared experience with multiple users, uh, something that is absent in other forms of web art. Um, this last piece, Colin experimented removing the camera, but still leaving the essence of user reflection. And this is demonstrated with the pixels actually picking up the color it sees. I kind of want to get into action here. So we feel that this approach to web art being intuitive and we uh, on purpose kept it as low cost as possible um, has possible use in other areas, obviously in gaming and entertainment industry, but we also think that it has some potential in physical rehabilitation, optic and uh, reflex testing, et cetera. Um, if you're interested in more of what we do, there is the URL. <laughs> no, there's not. <laughs> It's, it's on the NMC website. So thank you very much. Wow. Does anybody else want one of those to play with? <laughs> Talk to these guys later. And you better return that Bible to your uh, hotel room. <laughs> now we have on stage left Gail Krovitz from Pearson E College, who's going to be demonstrating um, some things she's been looking at using voice tools with students in her online courses. Gail, you have five minutes to go. All right, thanks. That's a hard act to follow. I have no virtual bubbles. I'm, I'm sorry about that. So um, if you take a, an instructor who's been teaching in a traditional classroom and you move them to an online environment, a typical complaint is that they feel disconnected from their students. And in many cases, this is literally because they're not hearing from their students the same way that they've been in a traditional classroom. And so using voice tools with the students can help bridge the gap. And fortunately, with Web 2.0, we have an abundance of tools, and it's really easy now for students to create their own audio content. And I have here listed four sample tools. And there's nothing magic about these tools. I don't mean to imply these are the only ones you can encourage your students to eat excuse me, your students to use. But uh, these are up here because they're the ones that I have experience with and also they're easy and free. So you gotta go with that. So let's look at some examples. The first one I show I the first one I want to show you is Jing, which is a screencasting software. You have a limit of five minutes. And so this is an example assignment. It's a Spanish speaking assignment where a student has to pick five items that they would buy at a store and then talk about them. In esta foto hay manzanas rojos y verdes. Hay alrededor de 50 manzanas en la foto. 
All righty, so that's a little bit about Jing. Moving on now, we have Vokey, and I love Vokey. Vokeys are really easy and really fun to do. They uh, come in a lot of different ideas. You'll see there are some animated, these are an animated avatar. You can choose a lot of different kinds. You can also customize them a little bit, which is fun. This is another Spanish language assignment, and this Vokey happens to be one that the instructor put together to explain the assignment. And then down here is the student assignment where you can see her Vokey, which is the recorded portion, as well as the text that's written out. So the instructor could grade both the written and the verbal portion if she wanted to. Hola, me llamo Eva. Tengo 13 años. Soy de Camer Township. Soy inteligente y lotica. No soy alta y no aburrida. Me gusta la música y el alado. No Okay, so that's a little bit about Vokey. Moving on, we now have VoiceThread. VoiceThread is a recorded discussion area, and you can see all of these little personas here can comment around this image either through voice or text. And also you can add multiple images here. This assignment happens to be a triangle hunt where students are encouraged to find examples of triangles in everyday life. And you'll notice when I play this one that the student is actually going to be annotating on the image as well. I realized that this line on one side of the pizza is just a little bit longer than that one. And of course, the crust is obviously shorter than both, so I think that this is a scalene triangle. It's also making me quite hungry. So see how much you learn from your students. He could have just said, yeah, it's a scalene triangle and ended it at that. So the last one I want to show you is Photo Story, and this, I know I feel bad, I have a PC, and my, many of you have Macs. There's lots of other movie-making software that's available. This is an example of a two truths and a lie discussion piece, where two pieces of information are true and one is a lie, and in the discussion we would try to figure out which is which. I once lit Winston Churchill's cigar in a wax Mr. Churchill's mouth. Number two. I streaked at my sister's college commencement ceremony. Number three, I caught a shark in the Pacific Ocean with my bare hands. All right, which one do you think it was? It was two. All righty, so moving on, let's talk a little bit about some assignments. We can do a whole variety of things. We can do introductions, various speaking practice, presentations, projects, peer review, and any number of creative projects. I have my students create a commercial around the course material, which is kind of fun. So best practices. You want to tell them up front about any equipment or software requirements, especially if they have to buy it or sign up. Provide a low stakes practice assignment earlier uh, in the semester or scaffold throughout the semester. Provide clear directions on the assignment and technology expectations. Specify what tech support you'll provide or what they have to figure out on their own. And think through the submission and grading requirements. As you know, all these tools create a different file types and you want to figure out how to get them in the shell. So the idea I want to leave you with is thinking of an assessment that you currently, or an assignment you currently assess in a traditional way and then brainstorm ways where you could transform that into a student audio assignment. And I'm sure I would have been gone by now because my time is going over. Thank you. <laughs> What's that about? Two out of eight for gong so far? Hi, Jared. Hey. <laughs> so now, the longest running show in five minutes of fame, Jared Bendis. Somehow you can say no, you know. Yes, yes. Coming to your <laughs> local theater. Jared has been doing this since the beginning of time, and he always manages somehow to game our system to be last. So I told him I wouldn't read much of his uh, description because I'd give it away, but he's going to be telling us about castles and geotagging. Jared. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Uh, so the name of my talk is uh, Which Castle Is That? Geotagging as a Tool for Research and Scholarship. And uh, yes, I forgot it began with the W. I should have called A Castle. All right, so first, all right, Lorenzo, put it down. Anyway, so the thing I wanted to ask myself today is what if I had a presentation that only took five minutes? This is not a summary of a very big presentation. This only takes me five minutes to give. So it's a little bit different and it's very personal. How many of you are photographers? Yeah, this is for you people and for the rest of you too, because, well, you're here. 
All right, I hunt castles. This, well, okay, not this one, but these types of castles. This is what I do. I photograph castles. It's a passion. It's a hobby. I've been to about 350 of them around the world. In the past 10 or so years, the things have changed. You know, 10 years ago, I couldn't have just gone and looked and found it and found a really nice, you know, satellite on Google. And because of this, it really does change the way you look at things. And of course, there's Disney. Now. Last summer, somewhere in the Pyrenees, I pulled over the side of the road and I took this photograph. And I'm like, oh, I think that's Kiribati, because I remember reading somewhere we were near Kiribati. And I remember thinking to myself, God, I hope that's Kiribati, because I'm not going to go there and like climb up that mountain. So um, I get home and it looks nothing like Kiribati. And I'm like, uh-oh. Then I find out I was nowhere near Kiribati, and here's what happened. Last year, I decided to travel with a Gistec photo tracker. This is a small device that you stick in your pocket. It's about 80 bucks, and every five seconds it goes, I'm here. It doesn't tell you, it just tells it into the data. It just brings in a data stream every five seconds and goes, I'm here. Every so often it makes, makes no, nasty noises. And when I get home, I take that data stream and I match it up with the time codes on my camera, and it says, you are here. And what that ends up happening is, is it tells me where I was. The problem is, it doesn't tell me where the photograph is. Now, for most of you, this isn't a problem because you're not shooting castles on the tops of mountains that are nowhere near you. But this can be a serious problem. Now, it's a needle in a haystack to go through Google and try to find these things and try to go, okay, what was it that I was taking a picture of? And let's go through this very, very quickly. If I take a look at the terrain, I go, wait a second, wasn't that tower on a hillside? And if I were to do that, wasn't it on a peak of one of those hillsides? Let's look at that map again. Can I see a tower in one of those peaks? Right there, maybe? Let's look at that. Can you see that right there? And so this is the type of thing that I want to start pointing into is, is the GPS didn't tell me anything, but it really helps me. And these are tools that help you do things. Now, if I take a wider view, this tells me both where I was and where it was. Now, which do you tag? And the serious problem here is, is they're both correct. And this is a problem you're going to run into with Google when you, when you go these days and look at these things because some people are tagging where they took the photograph and some people are tagging the content of the photograph. And they're not saying which one is which. And I wish there was almost two different maps where you can go, you know, people who are tagging their photos versus the people who are tagging their content. And so you have to really be careful when you click on the Eiffel Tower and you see like 100 photos around it but none of them on it. The people who are tagging on it didn't have geotaggers. So if I take a wider view of the area, I can take a look at not just not the city Casas de Penny, but I see Tatu Val is not far away, and they've got a website. And their website talks about interesting things in the region, like, hey, they've got a ruined castle. Is that my castle? Not a, not a, not a, not a chance. But is that my castle? Is that La Torre de, del Far? Well, it's hard to tell from that angle whether that's the same tower or not. But if I continue to do research on the region of the area, I can find a 19th century engraving of the southern elevation. Is that my tower? Let's try this again. Is that my tower? The Tower of Fire. Voila. And if you're interested more in some of these sort of activities that I do in terms of travels and castles, I invite you all to join my Facebook group from Castle to Castle Productions. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. And thank you, all of you Five Minutes of Famers. You guys did a fabulous job, didn't they? These are very brave people. They put a lot of effort into this, so thank you. Well done. OK, thanks. You guys are great. So they will get, each of them, uh, as a token, a little tiny gong. So they can gong people off of video conferences and, and things. <laughs> It's inscribed NMC 2010 FMOF, and if you will indulge us for just a minute, we're going to pass these out to them right now. We 
rehearsed this. Jared one. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thanks guys. Yeah. We'll sort it out. We rehearsed it but not very well.